Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Paul, I'm with the Dicey Review, and today we're going to be learning how to play the 1-5 to five player game Imperial Miners, being released by Portal Games. Imperial Miners comes with all of the components that you see here, including 18 event cards, 136 different mine cards in levels 1 through 4, 5 different surface boards, 5 progress markers, 60 coin tokens in 1 or 5, 40 cart meeples, 60 total victory point gems in 3 different denominations, 24 collapse tokens, 44 machine tokens, and 3 double-sided progress boards. To begin setup, first place the progress boards in the middle of the table, and you can randomly choose which side that you use for each board. Then shuffle decks 1 through 3 of the mine cards and place them near the progress boards, and then you can also place the level 4 progress cards near the mine boards as well, but there's no need to shuffle them because they all have the same effect. Then you can shuffle and deal out 10 of the event cards to create the event deck. The remaining event cards will be put back in the box and they won't be used for this game. Then place all of the victory point gems, machine tokens, coins, collapse tokens, and mine carts next to the progress boards forming a general supply. Each player will then choose a player color, and then place their progress markers below the progress boards, and then they'll find the matching surface board in their player color and place it in their play area as well. Then each player will draw a hand of mine cards. Once you've played a few times, you'll draw a number of cards, review them, and then discard some. For your first game, however, it's recommended that you draw two each of level 1, 2, and 3, making up a total of six cards in your hand. After all players have done this, you're ready to begin playing. Now we've set up for a two-player example with these two progress markers, but for the sake of table space and being able to explain clearly, I'm just going to have one surface board out that we use for our examples. In this full two-player game, another surface board would be visible. Before we begin to fully explain the structure of the game, it'll be helpful to look at the different mine cards in detail. Much of the game focuses on playing or activating these cards, and each card will have a few different markings or symbols that are important to note. Each card will have the level of the card printed on the bottom in the middle. Each card will also show the cost to play the card. Each card will have half cart symbols around the edge of the card, which are important during placement, for some card effects, and also during scoring. Cards will also have a faction symbol that shows which faction they belong to. And cards will usually have one or more effects that can be activated. Activating card effects is a big part of the strategy of the game, but it's important to note that if a card has multiple effects, you can only choose to activate one or the other, not both. A game of Imperial Miners will last for 10 total rounds, and each round is made up of two phases, the Event Phase and the Mine Phase. We'll look at the Event Phase first. During the Event Phase, one player will turn over the next card of the Event Deck, and then all players will have to resolve the effects of the Event Card. Event Cards will have a number of different actions or effects that have to be resolved, but in general, event cards will come in three different categories. They'll either be immediate effects that have to take place right away when the card is revealed. For instance, for this card, everyone would have to draw a level one card and then add it to their mind. Some event cards will have ongoing effects that will impact players throughout the round. For instance, this card will reduce the cost of cards played by four coins. And then some event cards are end of round event cards. These cards have to be resolved at the end of the round after everyone has completed the mine phase. The effects of these event cards have to be fully resolved if possible, and if it's not possible for a player to fully resolve the effect, they just need to resolve it as much as they can. All of the effects on the event cards are fairly straightforward and easy to understand. At this point in the video, we haven't talked about completing a mine cart or advancing on the different progress boards, but by the time we're done, all of these instructions will be fairly clear. For instance, after this event card is drawn, all players would either gain 4 coins or 1 point. And as a reminder, the coin and point tokens can be freely exchanged at any point during the game to make change. The point tokens come in values of 1, 5, and 10, and the coins come in values of 1 and 5. So if you need to make change for points or coins, you can freely do that whenever you need to. 
After the event card has been revealed, players would then complete the mine phase. And during the mine phase, players will add cards to their mines and then activate them. And the mine phase is played simultaneously by all players. And each player would follow these steps. First, a player would reveal a card from their hand and then pay its cost if applicable. At the start of the game, players will have to play a level one card. They'll have to do this because you have to be able to build off of existing cards in your network, and level one is the start. And also, players don't start with any gold, and all level one cards are free to build. There are some placement rules to keep in mind whenever placing mine cards, however. Cards have to be built into the appropriate level in your play area based on the level on the card. For instance, level one cards would be built here, level two, level three, and level four cards. Also, all cards have to be connected to another card by one of their half-cart symbols. It doesn't matter if the half cart is full or empty, although having a full half cart, like in this example, will provide bonus points at the end of the game. It's also important to note, as shown in this example here, that cards placed below into a different level have to be offset from the cards above them. So for instance, a level two card can't be built straight down like this. You have to build it offset halfway, like this or like this. Any card built below level 1 has to have a card above it. So for instance, if you wanted to build this level 2 card, you couldn't place it here even though it's connected to another card by a half cart symbol because there's no card above it. You could, however, place it in this location here. Level 1 cards are a slight exception to this rule. You can place a level 1 card in such a way that there's no surface board above it. So in this example, this placement would be legal for a level 1 card. This may become necessary if space becomes crowded in level 1 later in the game. In general though, most of the time it makes sense to connect level 1 cards to the surface board to potentially score bonus points for full carts at the end of the game. And as we mentioned earlier, when a card is placed, the cost for that card has to be paid immediately. Level 2 cards will all cost 2 coins, but level 3 cards will have varying costs, between 0 to 13 coins. If a player is unable to pay the cost for any of the cards in their hand, they'll simply reveal the top card from the level 1 mine deck and then build that card into their play area. And players can have as many cards in each row as they want to, just once again following the placement rules. Any cards below level 1 have to have a card above them, and cards in level 1 can extend as far as you want even if they don't touch the surface board. After players have revealed, paid the cost, and placed the cards in the mine phase, they would then activate the card that they just placed and any cards above it until they reach the surface board. So in our level 1 example, the players would activate this card that they just placed. They could either gain one coin or place a collapse token on this card to gain three coins. Then they would be able to activate one of the three options on their surface board and then their turn would be completed. So for instance, they could gain two more coins and that would be their turn. Let's say that it were later in the game, however, and a player had just placed this card during their mine phase. After the player had placed this card and paid any applicable costs, the player would be able to activate this card and then activate cards above them until they reach the surface board in a chain reaction. So for instance, this player could activate the ability on this card. It would allow them to choose any other card in their mine and then gain a point for each completed mine cart on that card. A completed mine cart is any space where there are two half carts full of gold. So in this instance, they could pick this card that has two completed mine carts on it and gain two points. After that, they would be able to choose one of the cards above their activated card to activate as well. They could either choose the left or the right card. In this example, we'll say that they chose the right card, gaining one coin for each different faction in their mind. They currently have one faction symbol from all six different factions, so they would gain six coins for that card. Then they would be able to choose one of the level one cards above the card they just activated. They would then be able to activate that card. In this example, we'll say they activated this Roman card, choosing the bottom option to gain two coins. This is possible because they have another Roman card in their mind, so this condition is met to gain two coins. After activating that card, they would then be able to activate one of the three options on their surface board to complete their turn. As you can see, the farther down you build, the more options you'll have whenever activating cards in a chain reaction. And if a player had built a level four card, they would be able to activate even more cards on their way up. Whenever you're resolving these effects, the effect of one card has to be fully resolved before moving on to a different card's effect. And as we showed in this example, even if there are multiple cards above the card that you're currently activating, you can always only choose one of the cards to activate. It's also important to note that each card in your mind can only be activated once per round. 
and there are some cards that will allow you to activate other cards during the mine phase. So for instance, if you were to play this card and use this card's ability to activate this card in your mine, you wouldn't be able to activate this card again during your chain reaction. So in this example, you would have to choose this card as the next card in your chain reaction. You just wouldn't get to activate it again if this ability already activated it during your round. Cards like this can still be very useful, however. If you were to place this card here, for instance, you could choose to activate this card and then activate this card and this card on your way up. So cards like this can be used to activate many cards in your turn, even ones that aren't in your normal progression up to the surface board. Most of the abilities on cards are fairly straightforward, but there are a few different tokens and things that we need to discuss so that you can fully understand the text on each card. Some cards will reference machine tokens like the Brick Factory we have here. The effects of these machine tokens will vary based on the card text. But in general, a card can only have up to three machine tokens on it. Many cards will give you different bonuses or options if you have machine tokens on the card. For instance, this card has an ability that allows you to activate a non-Atlantean card of a level that matches the number of machine tokens. So this card could allow you to activate a level three card if all three tokens were on there. Some cards will reference collapse tokens. For instance, you can place a collapse token on this card to activate any other card in your mind. Each card can only ever have one collapse token on it at a time. Collapse tokens are usually bad, although depending on the card text, they can actually benefit you as well. But whenever you try to activate a card that has a collapse token on it, that card's activation would be skipped and instead you would just remove the collapse token. After removing a collapse token, you would then continue to activate the cards above it in your chain reaction like normal. As I said, however, there are some cards that allow you to remove collapse tokens to gain points or benefit from collapse tokens in other ways. There are also some cards that allow you to gain minecart tokens or place cart tokens on your minecarts. Whenever you gain minecart tokens, you can place them on minecarts that are at least half full to complete those minecarts. So for instance, this minecart could receive a minecart token as it has half of the cart filled with gold. This minecart could also receive a token as could these two. But this minecart, for instance, that's completely empty could not receive a minecart token. A cart has to be at least half full to be able to have a token placed on it. That being said, however, if you place a cart token which makes a minecart full, it can benefit you in a number of different ways. Filled minecarts are worth victory points at the end of the game, one each. And there are also many cards that reference having full carts for their abilities. For instance, this proposal card that we looked at earlier will give you a point for each completed minecart on a particular card. Minecarts that have cart tokens on them are considered completed for effects like this and for in-game scoring. There are also abilities that will instruct you to draw cards or advance. Whenever you're instructed to draw cards from an ability, you could pick any one of the decks leveled one through three and draw them one at a time from one of these decks. You can't draw from the level four decks whenever taking a draw card action. You can only gain level four cards through the different progress boards or some events. And if you ever have more than eight cards in your hand, you have to immediately discard down to eight. When a card needs to be discarded, you would simply place it in a discard pile near the appropriate level deck. If an action ever tells you to advance, this refers to advancing on the progress boards. For instance, this action says you can spend a certain number of gold to advance two or five spaces on the progress boards. When you're given a number of spaces to advance, you have to advance on one of the progress boards until you get to the end of that progress board. To start off, you would pick a progress board to work on, and then you have to use your movement on that progress board until you reach the end. So in this example, if we had paid enough to advance five spaces, we would be able to advance up to five spaces on one of these boards. You would pick a board to advance on, start on the bottom level, that would count as one move, and then you would use your remaining movement to go as far as you want to on your particular progress board. So for instance, I could move the full remainder of my five spaces. I've already moved one, two, three, four, five. If I wanted to, I could stop right here and gain the reward. You would gain the reward where you stop you don't gain any rewards that you pass through. It's also important to note that you can stop short of your full movement. For instance, I could have stopped here, which would allow me to draw one level four card. And in this example, I'll say that I did that. If you ever reach the end of a particular progress board, 
you would stop on the last space, resolve the effect at the top of that board, and then you would place your marker on the first space of a different board. Any movement that you have left over after reaching the top of a progress board would be lost. You would simply end your advancing progress by moving to the bottom space of a different board. All of the rewards on the progress boards will be similar to the rewards that you'll see on other bonuses or on cards that you activate. There is one particular symbol, however, that's a little bit different known as a faction draw. The fact the faction draw symbol will sometimes specify a particular faction, for instance the Egyptians or the Romans. If you ever see a symbol like this where there's no particular faction printed on the stone, that means that you can choose any faction and then resolve a faction draw. If an effect instructs you to complete a faction draw of a specific faction, for instance the Japanese, you would choose a deck and then draw cards from that deck until you find the specific faction that was referenced by the faction draw. For instance, we found our Japanese card here. Any of the cards that don't match the faction that was specified would be reshuffled into the appropriate deck. The card that matches the faction would be added into your hand. Like I said, some spaces will specify a particular faction to draw, like in this instance the Barbarian, and some spaces will be a wild faction draw. If you're resolving a wild faction draw, you would pick any faction you'd like and then complete the same step. Pick a deck and then draw cards from that deck until you draw the specified faction adding it to your hand. If there aren't any cards of the faction that was specified or the faction that you chose in the deck that you're drawing from, you would reshuffle the entire deck and choose a different deck repeating this same process. After a player has placed a card during the mine phase and then activated all of their cards in their chain reaction, players would then see if there's an end of round event and if so, they would resolve that event before turning over the next event card and beginning with the next round. Once the final event card is drawn, players will complete one final mine phase, and at the end of this phase, the game is over after resolving any end of round events. Players would then tally their final scores, and their final scores would consist of all of their victory point tokens, and in addition, players would get one point for each filled mine card. So in this case, this player has one, two, three, four, five filled mine cards just on the cards, and then five additional filled mine carts from tokens. This would give them 10 additional points on top of the 41 points that they have from their victory point gems for a total of 51. The player with the most points total would win, and if there's a tie, the player that has the most remaining gold would win, and if there's still a tie, the player with the most filled mine carts in their mind would win, and if there's still a tie, the victory would be shared. All right, everybody, that was our video. Thanks so much for watching. We hope that it was helpful and we hope that it was informative. If you still have any questions about how to play the game, please comment below or email me directly at thedicereview at gmail.com and I'll do my best to answer those questions for you. You can always connect with us on social media or by visiting our Board Game Geek Guild. And like always, if you are enjoying the content that we put out, please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and then click the bell icon to be notified whenever we put out new content. All right, thanks so much for watching, everybody. And until next time, I'll see you at the table.